everybody. It's Coach Bronson here. And today I have the side father, Dr. Peter Ballerstead. He's the, the one and only guy who knows everything there is to know about generative agriculture and cattle farming and grass and the, the environment, all that kind of stuff, right? You're the guy. No, no, <laughs> it's, it's, it's incorrect. Anytime anyone says that they know everything about anything, that's yep. probably a good sign to put your left hand on your left back pocket and walk away. There you go. I like that. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff. We're going to talk about, I've got things on the, on topics and questions that I want to ask you about things that have to do with the environmental cost of, of cattle farming. Um, why plant-based alternatives are or are not good, good um, replacements for meat. Um, there's a class action lawsuit. I just heard. Recently, is it against it? Is it impossible or beyond? One of them. Yeah, one of, uh, one of them. I'm not clear on which. Yeah. Um, um, I just saw that this morning as well. Okay, we want to talk about um, what's better: grass-fed versus grass-finished versus grain-fed. That kind of stuff. Um, I know you have some really good information about when is a protein not a protein, um, and the quality and how stuff like that. So there's a lot of stuff on the docket that I want to kind of go over if we have time. Um, before we do that, I want to make sure that if you're not subscribed, anybody watching, if you're not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe, click on the little bell so you're notified every time I put out a new video. But most importantly, and specifically for this video, um, Dr. Ballester is going to go over a lot of good information that is going to probably enlighten you and give you information you didn't have before. If it impacts you and helps you, then that means it's going to impact and help other people. So please share the information, share the video, get the word out there about the benefits of regenerative agriculture, about eating meat for our health and for the environment. So Dr. Blasta, thank you very much for being on here. Appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Glad to be here. Uh, all right. So let's get started. So a little bit about you real quick. Just kind of go over your background and what, uh, what your mission in life is. So uh, by training, I'm a forage agronomist, ruminant nutritionist. That may need some definition, but basically <laughs> uh, working in those areas like hay and pasture and silage for dairy and beef cattle, also sheep and goats, but ruminants include even giraffes but buffalo, bison, elk, deer, yep. um, a, a large number of these animals. Um, I've had my own personal health journey that gets me very excited about making sure people understand about therapeutic carbohydrate reduction. And, you know, frankly, the, the good news, for example, from people like Verda, that type two diabetes, you know, five year drug free remission has just been published. So, I mean, that's really good news. Um, I'm very happy that people are interested in topics that I've been, you know, working in since, well, I graduated with my last degree in 86. So I've been around this space wow. for a while. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, I was trained by people who were working in this space for the generation before me. And then they were, so there's a long history of this. Um, for a number of reasons, we've gotten disconnected from that kind of information. So I just want people to understand a couple things. One, animal source food is essential for public health, that there's no sustainable food systems without animal agriculture mm. and therefore animal source food. Um, and then also that this animal source food is part of everyone's culture, part of everyone's tradition, you know, and, and family history and these things that bring us together. And I really think we need more of things that bring us together today. Um, so, so those are sort of my top three things. And then, you know, people get interested in many of the topics that you mentioned. And so I just want to make sure, you know, that, that people are aware of some of this information and where to go to learn more for themselves. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So uh, the first thing I have on my, on my list of questions is because it's a debate. I, I have people in my family. I have people that I know that want to debate me all the time on the effect that cattle have on the environment and how cow farts are killing us all. Can you kind of get into 
the, what, a little bit about that debate and, and maybe some of the information that people just don't have access to or don't know about, about how much cattle actually um, does or doesn't affect the environment. Sure. So first of all, I feel compelled to correct that it's not farts, it's belches. <laughs> it's and belches, okay. <laughs> it's belches. And, you know, the fact that people get that wrong commonly, you're not the only one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, kind of indicates the quality of the conversation, right? Sure. Um, and, but, but what is frequently not appreciated is that that's part of a cycling of carbon. So CO2 from the atmosphere via photosynthesis creates carbohydrates. Now, ruminants can utilize those carbohydrates. We can't, right? Because we're talking about fiber, right? Uh, those structural carbohydrates. Now, the reason that ruminants can use them is that they have this host of microorganisms in their rumen that allows for the breaking of those bonds between the glucose units that the cellulase enzyme that they have that no vertebrate animal has. Mm -hmm. So they're capable of liberating glucose, which the microbes then use to keep themselves alive, make more of themselves, manufacture proteins, Yep. Uh, and they convert those to volatile fatty acids. So you said cellulase. So that's, I'm assuming, related to cellulose. Yes. Okay, which if I understand my research correctly, it, it, it varies on ranges. But on average, we're looking at like 30, 33% of all plant matter is made of cellulose. Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. I mean, it's the most abundant carbohydrate in the biosphere. Right. Um, and, we, and, and we don't have that. We cannot break it down. So literally when we eat plant, bat, plant based food or plant matter, we're eat, it's like we're eating paper and we, our bodies can't do it with it. Well, it's yeah, we're eating a large amount of something that whether we can get benefit from it or not is debatable. <laughs> right? There's a lot of controversy about dietary yeah. fiber. But in the big scheme of things, if you think about large ecosystems, these ruminant animals and other herbivores, but the ruminants are really important. They're the key link in the energy transfer from the solar energy from plants, then into animals, then into other animals who eat those ruminants, for example, or the animals that uh, or organisms that rely, you know, utilize the dung, for example, from right. grazing animals, or they they break down that plant material. Mm -hmm. But so so to, to to complete the first thought, the the it's that anaerobic fermentation of fiber that's responsible for the emission of a small amount of methane. Okay. Okay, but that methane, when it's burped out into the atmosphere, only lasts for about 10 or maybe 12 years before it is oxidized to CO2. So okay. that completes that cycle. Okay. So if, for example, you could imagine that you had steady state herds of animals, that methane would result in no additional warming. Um, and if you could do something, and there's lots of things being researched to actually reduce methane, you could actually theoretically, as people are proposing it, see a cooling because they reduce the methane being emitted. Yeah. So, so, but unfortunately, too many people have heard things like, you know, cattle cause more emissions than transportation or more than half or whatever. Mm -hmm. In the US, out of the total anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, the whole budget that EPA releases, yep. beef cattle is responsible for about 2%, 2.0. Um, meanwhile, transportation is up around, a, you know, 25%, somewhere in right. that range. You know, um, we, we've got uh, a power generation equal amount, you know, so 
all of agriculture is somewhere around nine plus yeah, a little bit more than nine percent so that's okay. all ag okay. if you look only at animal ag that's about four percent of the total so less than cool. half of agriculture is coming from animal ag okay. okay that's very different than people here yeah absolutely and, and and the one thing there's there's only two sectors that can at this point sequester carbon and that's agriculture and forestry gotcha. and so if you you know that figure is estimated currently to be about 12 percent of total emissions that's the amount that's being sequestered okay so and then of that sequestering how much is agriculture in that percentage we don't know right is that a, is that a it, it's it's yeah it's it's it depends on how they budget it and right now it's like land use is sort of the bucket that they put that in okay um there's a lot of evidence showing first of all grasslands um having more carbon in the soil than under forests um forests tend to have it above and in some sure. ecosystems it's more susceptible to fire and being re-emitted um you know areas that are suitable for grassland versus forestry or you know so is this why the whole the movement for regenerative farming regenerative regenerative agriculture is so important because not only is it is cattle farming let's this is it's cattle not as big a percentage of the cause of global warming um, as people think, but it's possible to actually offset that even more by having regenerative agriculture that's going to sequester more carbon than the current standards that are out there. Yeah, I, I'm Does that makes sense. Am I connecting is, those dots, right? Yeah, yeah, I understand the popularity of regenerative as a term. Okay. What we yeah. need to understand is what people think they mean by that. And, yeah. and so if we're talking about well-managed grazing, again, that's been around for a very long time. What's, what's newer is in the cropping side of things. Okay. It's only been within the last decade or so, maybe two, that we've had tools and technology that allowed people to plant annual crops without the thorough cultivation that they used to have to do in order to control weeds etc cetera, etc cetera. Gotcha. okay so this is no-till and then it's cover crops with the no-till and now people are understanding that if hey we graze this we actually get a benefit above even doing cover crops so we're, we're finding these synergistic sort of things it, it strikes me that we're getting back to what used to be practiced many decades ago right. when we had mixed farming systems. And if you go back far enough, sort of back into the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in England, you had something called lay farming, L-E-Y, where they discovered that, OK, if I have, you know, a grass clover pasture, and then after a couple years of that, I plow it mm -hmm. and then plant barley or some cereal crop that really feeds, needs a lot of, you know, nutrients to grow. Okay. And then once that, you know, maybe I do that one or two years, whatever, and then I go into a root crop. You know, maybe turnips, maybe, you know, rutabagas, okay. stock gotcha. beets, things like that. And then after that, I go back into pasture. And so that was a system that was practiced. But again, to do that, they had to plow and they right. had to cultivate. So it's a little different than now when they have different tools. And I, I really th it's, it's my impression that that's where a lot of this is coming from. Or, or, or gaining a lot of traction in terms of those cropping systems okay. in a new way. So it's more about utilizing the grazing aspect of cattle to make sure to keep the land fertile without having to do things that are that are detrimental to it. Well, I, I think there's a there's there's a growing awareness of something that now is called soil health. 
mm-hmm. as a as a top as a title, and this is this is the acknowledgement that anytime you t- till the soil, you decrease the organic matter in that soil because mm. you're adding organic you're adding oxygen into that soil, which allows for the oxidation of yep. the organic matter. Um, uh, and, and it's not to say you should never plow, but that's just one of the things that happens. Also, yeah. when you destroy the cover that way, the, the vegetative cover, you then make that soil susceptible to water and windy erosion. Okay. And so now you're losing topsoil. Uh, with water erosion, you're going to have impact on surface water. Mm-hmm. Um, in general, you know, lose productive soils. And so th- that's something that people really became aware of, obviously, back in the 30s with the Dust Bowl. Um, but even earlier, as I speak to colleagues in North Dakota, as soon as they started breaking those soils to grow crops, they had wind erosion. Interesting. Okay. I mean, and that goes back to the late 1800s. So how how pre- how prevalent prevalence which which one is it prevalent or prevalent prevalent is what I'd say prevalent yeah how prevalent is some of the, are some of these new techniques or methods in industry right now like is it something that is kind of widespread is it mostly small farmers is it big corporate farming like kind of where does that stand and how things are changing yeah I don't know that I could accurately estimate what the percentage is uh, and and it should be remembered that these are tools that people can use, but when they're appropriate okay. right so if you're in an area that's really subjected to subject to wind erosion, for example, water erosion, mm-hmm. then obviously you're going to need to be doing things differently than somebody who's not in an area like that mm-hmm. um and and also we just need to bear in mind that you know us um agriculture and the rest of the world are a different conversation yeah um so i remember when i started working for the company i now work for um i i was i had been out of agriculture for some time and so i was learning about a lot of this and i went to some cover cropping you know conventions and they were talking about a number of things and 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 so there are clearly there are some innovative people who have been adopt they're what we call early adopters yeah. and so they've been on this journey for a while learned a lot um some of them then go on to teach others some just continue to do it and you know uh, that's so i i'd say some of this probably now goes back maybe 15, 20 years for some of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of what, what drives adoption of technology frequently is, is there, are there programs to support its adoption? Okay. And, and so in some places, yes, in some places, no. Mm-hmm. Um, again, there had been um, large programs to control erosion so you had a number of things, but then the farming landscape changes. Sure. In the in the way with the economy in the U.S. and things like that now, um, I know a lot of people are just worried about just being able to get meat um, yeah. mm-hmm. without going broke. How can me and how can I and the people watching this, how can we help that process along? Is there specific do we is this one of those things where you say buy from your local farmer or buy from your local cattle rancher like how do we how do we make an effect on on speeding up the process well sure uh that's a great question and part of my mission is i i don't want us to be putting impediments in front of people adopting what i'm convinced is a life-changing yeah you know course of action so part of the messaging that's been out there is you know that there's we need people to understand that if they go to the supermarket what they can buy at the supermarket 
animal source food, not Twinkies, not, yeah. <laughs> n- and not yeah. you know, you don't call Pop-Tarts a serving of fruit, okay? But mm. as, when it comes to animal source food, what you can get at your supermarket is safe and healthful. And that's what we should be eating. And, and the primary thing is that we should be encouraging people to buy what's affordable to them, what's mm-hmm. accessible to them, because access is a key issue, um, what's appropriate for their background, right? Um, and, and we need to, I am very suspicious of a lot of the label claims. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it, it, you know, and then you could put all the string of things up to and including watered with unicorn tears and panda massaged and all that stuff. And it's like, well, uh, um, and so also not everybody is in touch with their local farmer, mm-hmm. right? The vast majority of people in the United States live in urban suburban areas. Now, right. some of those people have access to farms and one of the advantages of beef is it's there are cattle in every state. So, right. I mean, you want local food, there you go. But not everybody can have, you know, a freezer right. beyond, you know, the bottom of their refrigerator um, or the side or the top, depending on your model. <laughs> um, and so buying in bulk isn't an issue for everyone. And, you know, yeah. some of these things. So, you know, buying hamburger, buying lost leader eggs at the supermarket, we sh- uh, I need to see hard data to tell me why I should be telling somebody not to do that, especially awesome. as we're going into this age of, you know, increased food supply, uh, food yeah. uh, prices. Yeah. And and just so people understand, when you say lost leader eggs, you're basically saying the cheap eggs that nobody else wants to buy. Well, loss leader in the supermarket is we're going to price these so low, low that right. people so can, come in to get right. them. Now they do that with orange juice and we don't want to buy the orange juice, exactly. but right. eggs so, is one of the things that they'll do that for. Right. So and from so a, you, a marketing term, it, it just means it's lower price to get people to come in. So it's not. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly it. Um, okay. Well, so, I mean, that kind of leads into the next question, which I think you basically just answered. And I was going to ask about, you know, does it matter if it's, grass finished, grass fed, grain fed, all that kind of stuff. And basically from what you just said, it's go with what you can afford, what fits your lifestyle, what makes the most sense for you right now. And worrying about the air quotes quality um, isn't nearly as much of an issue. Yeah, um, I would also say if you like to eat grass fed beef, right. you know, that, that, that is a different product. And so not everybody likes it. But if you do, that's fine. Um, and and there are probably things about, you know, how to cook it as opposed to, you know, sort of conventional supermarket mm-hmm. grain finished beef. Um, but when it comes to things like the health claims that have been made, uh, we need to have a harder conversation about that. When we when people talk about the environmental impacts, we need to have a harder conversation about that. When people talk about the animal welfare, you know, all of those can be sort of deconstructed. So I'm all I I absolutely want to work with producers who can who want to and can produce, you know, market beef off grass alone. You know, the key thing is they have to do it and make a profit. There's no sustainability without profit. And so that's key. Um, and then, you know, I want uh, people to avoid unnecessarily subdividing the industry. And so, you know, when you begin to see the forces arrayed against animal agriculture Mm -hmm. for reasons that often are not legitimate in my mind, they're not scientific, they have to do with someone's personal beliefs and then their desire to impose those beliefs on other people that I consider illegitimate. Mm -hmm. Um, So the that subdivision us against them. um, um, Yeah, I don't think that that's wise for us. Because at the end of the day, those same people will come against the grass finished beef. But they're not big enough to worry about now. 
right? Right. It's 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 those same people are against pet way down, right? Yeah. Yeah. The same people are against pet ownership. They're against horse ownership. They're just smart enough not to say anything about it because it might hurt fundraising. Right. right. So so that's that's kind. Of, but but again, I want to eliminate unnecessary barriers to adoption. Mm -hmm. And I've heard people say, if you're not going to buy all organic, you're not going to buy all grass fed, you shouldn't even adopt a therapeutic carbohydrate reduction type approach, call it whatever, keto, call it carnivore, call yep. it whatever. And I'm uh, at that point, I'm twitching real hard because we're, uh, you don't have data to support that. Absolutely. I think, I think it's, yeah, I think it's definitely one of those things we, we as humans, we, not even as humans, I think just in the process of making these changes for a lot of people, we get stuck on a lot of the minutia. And honestly, uh, this could probably be a whole different conversation. I think a lot of people use that minutia as a way to stall or make an excuse for why they can't. Uh, right. Well, well sure, I can't I can do put, that. I, so I'm just not going to yeah. do this, you know, and I, I can put my hand up, but I've had people say that to me from the audience. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it's like, well, OK, so maybe my experience colors my perception of this a little bit but you know if if people are concerned about polyunsaturated fatty acid content in meat then you probably shouldn't be eating walnuts you know you want to be eating ruminant meat not poultry not fish not okay. pork go into that because that's on my list you, okay. you knew i was going to ask about that <laughs> <laughs> well, so one of the wonders of ruminant animals is it, you can't put too much fat into their ration or you interfere with fiber digestion, which causes all kinds of problems. Okay. So we're talking 5%, somewhere in that range of their total ration can be fat. Gotcha. Now, what's very cool is at the end of that fermentation process, 70 to 80% of their energy comes from fat because they convert carbohydrate into fat for us instead of us doing it. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> um, it. but it seems that polyunsaturated fatty acids are even more toxic to the rumen environment than mono or saturated fatty acids. And so the more polyunsaturated fatty acid you try to put in the ration, the lower the total fat can be. Hmm. And they have this, they, the microorganisms within the rumen environment have this process that they call biohydrogenation. Okay. So they naturally reduce some of those double bonds. And that's where we get the CLA and some of those products from. Gotcha. Um, so the the ruminant digestive system is really you you have this anaerobic fermentation process at the beginning of essentially our digestive system okay so all of that occurs before the acidic stomach the gastric mm -hmm. and then the small intestine and large intestine so basically Anything that's susceptible to rumen fermentation is just broken down as much as it can. Any protein that comes in that's soluble, that's degradable, gets broken down into individual amino acids. Mm -hmm. If you have too much in there without enough energy, then you lose a lot of ammonia that the animal then has to excrete because the microbes are busy taking it and breaking it down and making microbial protein. Okay. So one of the cool things that can happen in the rumen is you can take non-protein nitrogen. So from nitrate that would be in plants, just mm -hmm. for example. Yep. And if there's sufficient energy, then the organisms can take that and make microbial protein out of it. And how is that? So when we talk about the quality of the meat that we're getting from, from ruminants versus chickens, right? And that's because they're different. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, what it, so, what it, and so the, the end product is different now. Well, the, the, the quality of the, 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 the nutritional content of the meat from ruminants is far less influenced by diet than that for monogastrics like swine, poultry, fish. Okay. 
just due to the nature of mm -hmm. of this system and and that's because of this anaerobic fermentation process that takes place this microbial actually you know it's like they're 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 culturing this big population of microbes which they then harvest the microbes right they eat the microbes in a very real sense well, they've as got well helmet, as their byproducts right, they've got how many stomachs and they got all this stuff yeah, going four. On they, they got all yeah. this they got a lot more stuff going on internally than we do yeah indeed um <laughs> and and they've been around you know ruminants long predate primates yeah. long predate you know it's interesting that you said the, the the thing you said about they're breaking down the carbohydrates into fat for us i've never really thought about our digestion like looking at this holistically if we could draw a picture like ruminants are part of our digestive system mm. and mm. looking at it that way right um yeah. i think that's kind of a really kind of a cool a cool way to look at it like they're taking part of they're doing part of the job for us so when we eat them we don't have to worry about that well and if if we think about uh jessica thompson yale professor um i forget the title of her talk about fat uh f i don't think it's fat of the land but no, in any the, case that's the stephenson yeah, yeah. So she gave a presentation, uh, basically outlining her work and and this um, this theory that instead of the cutting and cut marks on bones as indication of first tool use, mm. and it was us eating meat that then led to all these you know sort of developmental advances in the hominid human homo kind of lineage. Okay. Yeah they're saying well no we see evidence of percussive marks oh. of round bone round rocks on bones to get to marrow or skulls to get to brain and then the theory is okay we've got a food resource that wasn't being utilized by the scavengers that were then present on the grasslands this clever hominid comes along and finds a way to exploit that uh, before they began eating a lot of muscle meat because mm. the 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 key carnivores were already eating that and right. you know whatever so okay here is this and and at one point in she shows a piece a a, a bone fractured in cross section with fossilized marrow in it Mm. And and she describes this, you know, like in the middle of this grassland with some trees, right? But whatever the trees are producing is seasonal. It's like finding a stick of butter in a landscape devoid of fat is how right. is her line, right. I think. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah, that idea of you know the ruminants are this key source of fat in the grassland ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then also protein as well, um, because obviously, you know, these aren't massive fields of soybeans or other beans <laughs> or peas. So, you know, there are legumes there, but they're going to be making nitrogen that the plants are going to be utilizing. Yep. So a lot of that is not going to be protein in the sense that we think of it. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's going to be the non-protein nitrogen, but it has to be cycled through an animal often for it to be available for other plants, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So the ruminants are this key part of all this ecosystem. And then to tie it back to what now people are talking about is, you know, you've got a grass plant growing above ground and you've got about equal amount of biomass or more in roots below ground mm -hmm. as organic matter. And then there's an emerging understanding of substances that are excreted by those roots into that rhizosphere the area in the soil right around the roots mm -hmm. and so these plants protect the soil they're putting carbon and organic matter into the soil they're feeding the microorganisms um, and then when an animal comes across and grazes that a lot of 
that root mass is not maintained because it's got to regenerate it as somebody said it's like you ripped off the solar panels now you got to build more solar panels and if you don't manage the grazing properly you'll do that before you've recharged the battery by you know the new solar panels yep. or even worse um a plant like alfalfa will put energy into its root itself that's mm. where it stores its energy reserves uh a lot of most grasses put it into a stem base okay. which is still above ground or right. very close to so if you graze too close now you're not only removing the solar panels you're eating the batteries too and if you do that too frequently then you weaken the stand and you open it up and then some bad things happen so these gotcha. are things that people are getting greater awareness of so you mentioned so you know having cattle in these these grasslands uh you know going back to human history um i love that stick of butter analogy right there's nothing in here but i got some bone marrow i, I love it um not just fat, but protein. Talk about what does, when you talk about us eating protein, what do you mean by protein? Yeah. So and what's when not protein or when is protein yeah. not protein? Yeah. So that, that's one of my titles. If, if we look in a food table, if we look on a food label, what is listed as protein is in fact what we in animal science call crude protein. Okay. Now, same thing in human nutrition, but for any number of reasons, that point gets lost. So crude protein is a long standing metric that we use to quantify nutrient value of feeds or foods. Mm -hmm. um, and it's determined and has been since 1880s. Um, basically, we determine the percent nitrogen in a sample. Okay. We take that percentage and we multiply it by 6.25 based on the assumption that all the nitrogen that was in that feed or food was in protein and all that protein was 16% nitrogen. Okay. So we're making so, some assumptions. Okay. Massive assumptions. Now, again, when it comes to feeding ruminants, that can kind of sort of work until we get to really high levels of production because they can use non-protein nitrogen. Now, in some cases, that nitrogen is in substances that aren't digestible in the rumen. Right. And that's kind of part of the what we've learned to do over the years. But in, in human nutrition, we need amino acids. Mm -hmm. We don't need other nitrogen containing materials right so there are things there's something else called non-protein nitrogen and that's always higher in plants than it is in animal source foods and you know in potatoes i've seen figures that it can be as much as a quarter of the nitrogen mm, okay. okay and and so you know we have essential amino acids that we have to have and they have to be there in the right amounts and the right proportions to each other mm -hmm. there's no such thing as an essential amino acid in a ruminants diet hmm. okay. which is, again part of this you know I've, I've said it before there's there's no such thing as an essential fatty acid or an essential amino acid in a ruminants diet there are both of those in a human diet that's very there's, interesting there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate in a human's diet yep. there are two forms of carbohydrate that are essential for a ruminant wow you, you See, have I've to never have, heard that before okay you have to have both fiber and you know cell contents and cell walls structural and non-structural in order for the rumen to function properly so okay back to your question um no, that's 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 like i love that okay so we have to so one of the problems is we have not been paying attention to the amino acids in these foods yeah we've not been evaluating their availability and you know, unfortunately, just presence in a food isn't enough. We have to be able to absorb it. Yep. So there's some things that I've come across just because I've been looking outside of the US. And it's like 
humanity gets more of it. So you look at these figures for protein supply and it's crude protein mm -hmm. and humanity gets more of its crude protein from cereals than it does from all animal source foods combined. Wow. And wheat is the single largest source of crude protein crude in protein. humanity's diet. So the basic element of this is protein, whether it's usable or not. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, and, and, and yet we know that cereals are deficient in lysine. And there are people who have known for a while, and now we have tools to see it, that when you process a lot of these plant source foods, you make what amino acids are there, especially lysine in this case, less available. So there's a system called DIAS, mm -hmm. Digestible Indispensable uh, Amino Acid Score. Um, and, and what it does is it looks at the amount and its availability relative to some goals okay. based on age. And if we take wheat, for example, uh, for adults, you know, it's somewhere in that 50% of what we need range, okay. but nobody eats raw wheat berries, right? So when we grind it up and make whole wheat bread out of it, we drop that to like 20. Hmm. And if we make a crispy, crunchy breakfast cereal out of it, we make it essentially zero. Right. And so now, but see, what could happen is if you eat in theory, right? Mm -hmm. If you eat that crispy, crunchy breakfast cereal with real dairy on it, you can complement you know, what's being provided by the dairy might be sufficient and is to make up that shortage. Okay. Okay. So in theory, I'm not advocating breakfast cereal. Okay. I just right. um, sure. saying. Sure. So now we have tools, but unfortunately people, you know, we've been squandering time and resource. Well, time is a resource. Right. Um, trying, you know, to, to look at nutritional epidemiology of chronic disease rather than doing actual nutrition work. Um, so where that you, you mentioned that court case, uh, and, and I think this is what I understand from some other work, that they've done dias values with impossible and beyond burgers mm -hmm. and compared it to beef and pork burgers. Right. Okay. So impossible i remember is made with soy because it has s's in it and beyond is made with pea protein because it doesn't have the s's okay <laughs> pea protein does not qualify for a protein quality claim okay soybeans do okay so the 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 impossible burger can by itself qualify as a good source of protein mm -hmm. To be excellent, it has to be above 100. Okay. And I think good is 85 to 100, something like that. So, okay, but nobody eats just the impossible burger patty. Right. Well, but even if they did, right, then there's, you know, I mean, this is beyond just the talking protein, but there's the beyond? other stuff it's made with, right? Yeah. It's, you know, the, the seed oils and all the other. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Things. But just in terms Stories, of their protein yeah. quality yeah. claims. Right. So when you put it with a wheat bun, the wheat bun is deficient in lysine. And there's not sufficient lysine in the impossible burger, patty, plant mm -hmm. puck, to make up for the deficit in <laughs> the wheat bun. So now it, now it isn't even a good source of protein. Gotcha. Okay. As, as a meal. Right. And that's important because, you know, we don't just sit down and eat protein, right? As you were just saying, well, we're going to ingest a lot yeah. of other things along with protein. And, and, and then there's the whole question of, is the quality of the protein that we're eating driving our ingestive behavior? And, and, and you know, I, I have no problem believing that. My concern with the research is it's confounded by reporting crude protein. Right. Well, you, I think in your presentation, you had a, a, a graph that showed 
like all the different countries. And it was like all the countries who re, you know are reporting, you know, these these many, this much of the population is getting all of the protein that they need. But then when you actually put in the quality or the bioavailability oh, yeah. of the protein that they're getting, no country's getting the protein that they need. Yeah, that was Moen's paper from last April. Um, and and it, what he what they did was they went and found global food supply, you know, so that they could calculate kind of by country average intakes. Mm -hmm. And and part of the argument somehow has been that protein is not a nutrient of concern. And, and yet what they show, what he and his colleagues showed was if, if all you, and, and I think he looked at like a hundred and some odd countries and territories on the low and low middle, you know, income country spectrum. Mm -hmm. And when you looked at total crude protein, and I think they use the phrase gross protein, but it means the right. same thing that only a couple at the very low end didn't meet that target. Now, one, the target's too low. Absolutely. Uh, right, so that, that, right. that's RDA 0.8, you know, not appropriate. Okay, um, but that was because they were looking at, so what they then said is, well, what about the digestibility of right. that and so because they had both plant and animal sources they could look at that and and now and then ultimately what they did was they went and looked at lysine because lysine is the globally limiting kind of right. amino acid and so when you looked at that level now virtually all those countries were not oh. meeting the target and then we can come home to the united states because in the 20 well 2015 dietary goals, no, dietary guidelines, sorry, in the 2015 report, they looked at the NHANES data mm -hmm. and they looked at men and women and they looked by age and their own data, that data showed that 40% of Americans were not meeting that low target. And, and most- Is that crude? Yes. Oh man. That's wow. the second whammy. Wow. And, and and then this and most females over the age of eight aren't getting enough. And that's in the United States. Yeah. And then we can add on to that all this that we see around the world where a third of women of childbearing age are anemic. And and B12 status in mother's milk. And you know, there's been studies looking at this and just we can do better. But we've we've you know part of this is economic, right? Part of this is um, you know the effect of poverty and issues that need to be worked out. But we can work on those things. But in high income countries, it's the result of dogma, yep. and it's the result of these belief systems that just it, it as you can tell, drives me to distraction. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. There's a ton of good information. I hope everybody that's watching this watches this like two or three times because. I know I'm going to watch it a few times and probably pick up some things here and there that I missed the first time. But thank you very much, Dr. Ballister, for being on. I appreciate it. Do you have anything that you want to leave everybody with? Any information or a word of wisdom? Well, yeah, word of wisdom. We'll skip right past that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> look, every, you know, everything we do affects the environment. Any form of food production is going to affect the environment. We're not good at weighing the pluses and minuses. And we really haven't begun to look at what is the environmental burden of chronic disease? What's mm. the societal burden? What's the economic burden? Because anytime we talk about sustainability, we have to be talking about environment, economic, and societal. Right. And, and we know that this is a massive burden. And so part of my message is when you, when you improve your health, you are improving the world. I love it. I love and it. that may be the most practical, most accessible thing that any of us can do, right? Yeah. And yeah. In, in part because we don't know who's watching us. 
right? And a lot of us would rather watch a sermon than listen to one. So just, you know, we, you see the transformation in somebody, how did you do that? You know, the pivotal patient influences a doctor to change. These sorts of things add up. Remember, a, a tipping point is not 51%. It's like 18%. Mm. I mean, it's, you know, just that critical it's mass yeah. uh, to, to get this rolling faster. And I'm not naive and I'm not, you know, uh, Pollyanna about all this, but what else do we have as an option? Yeah. Uh, you know, the same people, we, we need to understand also that the same people that sold us the diet that got us here, you know, that did this in the 70s, mm -hmm. they were also selling what's now the environmental messaging. Right. Those are all part of the same thing. And so, you know, it, we, we need to figure out for ourselves what's best for us and then if people are interested in some of these other factors, then please look me up. I'm access, uh, accessible on uh, social media. Mm -hmm. I've got lots of content on YouTube and other places. Uh, if you run into me at one of these, you know, uh, conferences, you know, please, please come up and talk to me. Um, and you, you can reach me at Peter Ballers, Peter Ballersted at gmail.com. Uh, and so in any way that I can help somebody along this journey, I'm not that kind of doctor. Uh, I'm qualified to tell you how much fertilizer to apply to your pasture <laughs> and grazing management and all that kind of good stuff. But we know good doctors, right? So yes. we can oh, a lot. Yeah. In introduce, you know, and, and, and so we need to build bridges between our various disciplines. Awesome. Um, so, so that's kind of how I wrap it up. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. And I look forward to seeing you. Are you going to be at KetoCon this year or what's the next conference you're going to be at? Uh, the next conference I'm going to be after the meat science conference next week is um, Keto Fest oh, okay. in New in London. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, after that is uh, Low Carb USA in San Diego. Gotcha. I'm probably going to be there. We'll see how that goes. Excellent. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you I'll very much. I'll take a drive up the coast and come to come to New London. There we go. Yeah, I, you know, it's hmm, we'll see how it goes. Okay, got it. Thanks. Until the next time. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.